All right, guys, in this video, we're going to talk about standard error of the mean, which is a statistical technique for analyzing a set of sample data. Sometimes standard error of the mean is abbreviated as SEM. I think the College Board typically uses SE sub X. X with a bar over it also means mean. Um, so it's the same thing. So to introduce SEM, let's just think about a very simple experiment, or maybe you're trying to show that fertilizer makes plants grow taller. Um, so you have an experimental group where you add fertilizer and a control group where you don't add fertilizer. Maybe if you were just to eyeball these numbers, it kind of looks like the plants with fertilizer are generally taller, but you'd want to use some statistical techniques to kind of analyze your data um, a little bit further. And so let's just talk about some basic ones in this video. If we look at your equation sheet, um, the front page, um, we're uh, kind of focused here at the top half. So if we really look at that, then um, I've zoomed in here. We're really gonna talk about three statistical measures of a sample set of data here in this video. We're gonna talk about mean, standard error of the mean, and standard deviation. Um, we'll talk about chi-square later. Uh, SEM and standard deviation have stars by them on the new equation sheet because I think the College Board will not expect you to calculate these values for the AP test. Um, but they will certainly want you to know about what they mean, and in particular with SEM, how to interpret them um, once they've been calculated, which we will also talk about in this video. Um, uh, the meaning of all of these uh, variables and terms are also over here in case you forget on the right side. So let's take a look um, at our sample data again, and maybe one of the simplest measures of statistical um, ways to look at a sample set of data is just the mean. Um, you're probably familiar with mean, this looks like a really complicated formula, but just take each data point, x sub i, add them together, that's the sigma notation, take that sum and divide it by the sample size. So in this case, just add up all your data points um, and divide by six, right? Because there's six samples here. So that would give you a mean of 6.5 for the no fertilizer group and a mean of 7.0 for the fertilizer group. So then maybe you could go on to graph. Um, hopefully you know to make a bar graph in this case because you have categories here for your x-axis. Um, and so maybe you'd make an even scale and you'd plot and it looks pretty clear that the fertilizer group is a little taller than the no fertilizer group. But we run into a problem here, right? In a sense, what we've really only established is that in this sample group of plants, fertilizer appeared to make the plants grow taller. So we kind of have like the problem of universality, right? Does this sample trend really apply universally to all of the plants of this species? Um, might be something that our sample data, at least currently, really can't tell us. And that's what SEM is really going to try to help us um, answer. Um, the idea of standard error of the mean is that if we can assume a normal distribution of the data, a normal distribution, again, is basically like a bell curve, right? Um, for the most part in this course, um, uh, many of the things that we're going to measure in lab might assume a kind of bell curve distribution of possibilities for the results. So assuming that normal distribution, SEM is going to use statistics from the sample data set that we collect to try and estimate what's called the true population mean. It's kind of a theoretical concept, but basically it's sort of thinking about what are all of, if we could measure all of the possible plants out there of this species, um, that would be like the true population mean, right? Um, and, and that might help us kind of think about, you know, all right, so more universally than just the sample data set, what might be going on here? So in order to measure that, we're going to uh, just need two variables for standard error of the mean. We need to know the sample's uh, standard deviation and the sample size. Um, we already know sample size, so now we just need to calculate standard deviation, which is over here. Standard deviation is a very complicated formula to apply, so that's why we're going to typically just use um, software like Microsoft Excel to calculate it for us. But just to show you at least once how you apply this formula, um, you're just going to take each data point again, x sub i, and you're going to subtract it from the mean of that group, which we've already calculated. We're going to square that because we're, we're not really uh, interested if the uh, each data point is smaller or larger than the mean. We just want to know how far away is it because standard deviation is ultimately trying to give us a measure of the spread of the data. Um, how far apart is the data? 
So subtract each from the mean, square it, add all of them together, take that whole quantity and divide by the sample size minus one, and then square root that whole mess. So applying that briefly, take each data point, subtract it from the mean, square it, do that with every other data point. Okay, square everything. Um, take that whole mess and divide it by the number of samples minus one, and then square root that entire quantity, right? So again, not very easy to calculate um, by hand. Um, so that's why I'm typically just gonna give you the standard deviation of any sample data set that we acquire. So here, point two, a fairly small spread. Maybe that makes sense given that these numbers are pretty close to each other. Um, our experimental data set, though, is ultimately going to have a much higher standard deviation because there's quite a bit more spread if you just kind of look at this data. And so that's why the standard deviation comes out almost five times higher than the control group. Okay, so if we know those standard deviations, then that will help us uh, uh, calculate standard error of the mean because it's just going to take the spread of each data set and by dividing that by the square root of the sample size, that gives us the ability to add and subtract that quantity from our sample mean. Um, and if we do that, if we just take, say, one SEM added to the sample mean, and really it's the sample mean minus the SEM, I should have flipped that, um, then we can say with 68% confidence that the true population mean might fall within that range. Um, why 68%? Because if we look over here, this is kind of more statistics, but if we add these two pink groups together, that's subtracting and adding a standard deviation. As it turns out, what we're going to do much more um, often here in AP Biology is we're going to add and subtract two SEMs from the sample mean because um, at two standard deviations away, you'd be adding the purple and the pink numbers. That gives us 95% confidence that the true population mean would fall within that range, and that's pretty good. Um, that gives us a lot of confidence that that's, that's where it might fall. So that's going to be our typical move. Um, so let's go ahead and apply that now to um, our sample set of data. Uh, by the way, this is called a confidence interval sometimes too. Um, so we're, we're often going to try to establish a 95% confidence interval. So um, looking at our sample set of data, what if we now know the mean, standard deviation, and sample size? Um, then we can apply our formula. It's just the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. That gets us a number. We're going to multiply that times 2, and then we're going to take that number and subtract it from our sample mean and also add it. So what we're really saying is, with 95% confidence, we think that the true population mean for all these plants that we don't add fertilizer to would be somewhere between 6.34 and 6.66. Okay, um, For the uh, fertilizer group, because we have a larger standard deviation, we're going to get a larger SEM, which gives us a larger spread in our overall estimates of what's called you know, the lowest possible and the highest possible number. Um, they might be anywhere from 6.27 centimeters high to 7.73. Uh, a lot more uncertainty there just because of the spread of the data. Okay, um, What can we do with that information? Well, we can graph it. Um, we're still going to graph our sample means as bars, but what we're going to add is that lower and upper bound calculation. Um, and those are sometimes just called error bars. And again, what that really is reflective of is that our true population mean might fall anywhere within that range. It's usually good to indicate on your graph how many SEMs you calculated. Um, again, for our course, we're always going to do two for a 95% confidence interval. Okay, what does that tell us? Um, by the way, you can also do this for line graphs. So if you happen to have data that was continuous on both axes, um, then you would make a line graph perhaps instead. And so you'd still be plotting your data points for your sample means, but you can still draw error bars on data points to show the upper and lower bound of your true population mean. Okay, so let's just finish this video. This is the most important part. So um, it, it's the interpretation of all of this work, right? Um, what does all this mean? How is it gonna add to our understanding of our experiment? And the idea of it is that when you see intense overlap between your groups, like we're seeing here, 
What we're really saying is if you were to repeat this experiment, you really might get a sample mean that falls anywhere within this range, at least with 95% confidence. Um, why is it a problem if the two groups overlap like they're doing here? Well, maybe you might get another sample mean where the data is, um, say, right here, something like 6.7 for the no fertilizer group, but your fertilizer group might be somewhere down here, say, like at 6.3. So what appears in this sample um, as if the fertilizer is making the plants grow taller, that reality really indicates that the fertilizer might also make the plants be shorter, right? When there is intense overlap between your two groups, what we're really going to say is that there's no significant difference between the groups. Whatever the sample results show isn't relevant here. We're interested in what the true population means show us. So maybe if there is no significant difference between the groups, we can't really reject our null hypothesis or support the alternate hypothesis that we were proposing in the first place. That doesn't mean we've disproven it either, right? It just means that this sample data set really isn't good enough to show what we were hoping to show. That's one possibility, but the other possibility is that maybe if the SEM error bars don't overlap at all, maybe if my control group had been down here and my experimental group had been way up here, um, when there's no overlap, then maybe even if another set of, of control data was way up here and another set of experimental data was way down here, the experimental group is still higher than the control group. So what we're really showing is that when there is no overlap in the SEM error bars, there is a significant difference between your two groups. And maybe that can help you successfully reject your null hypothesis and support the alternate that you had. So what did we do in this video? We tried to show you how to calculate statistical measures. Um, especially important to me is calculating mean and SEM. Um, and then we really tried to focus on how SEM adds to the interpretation of a sample set of data um, and what it really means when the SEM error bars between two groups overlap and what it means when they do not overlap.